Okay, we got time for the, the third and I think final uh, uh, question uh, for our panel, which is um, enabling conditions. You know, how many of you recognize the name Jamie McKenzie, by the way? All right, so a couple of people. Ja this is really interesting. So in doing a little bit of background research, uh, Jamie McKenzie was the kid who Edison saved from being squashed by a boxcar in a potential railway accident. And it turned out that Jamie McKenzie's dad was uh, a telegraph uh, a a operator and expert who, out of gratitude, uh, took Edison under his wing and taught him how to be a, t a telegrapher. Uh, and out of that experience came his interest in communications arguably, right? So if, if Jamie McKenzie's dad had been a doctor, you know, history would probably have been, different. might have been quite different. Which raises the question of the context and the environment and the enabling conditions for creating Edison's. And I guess I want to turn the optics around a little bit for the panel and just say, you know, from the point of view of our country right now today, based on our reading of the life of Edison and all these lessons that we've been discussing, what, if anything, can we do to try to create the enabling conditions for generating more Edison's, or at least more Edison-like behavior? I mean, I'd argue that that's changed dramatically, okay. you know, within, uh, the, within America. Um, it reminds me of the story of the band Fleetwood Mac. I don't know if you know this story, but uh, everyone knows that their most famous album, Fleetwood Mac Rumors, right? And that they had a, another album, Fleetwood Mac, Fleetwood Mac. But does anybody know how many albums were in between? Six. Thirteen. Oh, my gosh. Right? And three different bands, three different iterations of the band, right? So the moral of the story is that was a number of years and how many firms or how many companies would be willing to wait 13 albums to get rumors today, right? You know, it's always the guy who comes in with the hockey stick effect as opposed to the one who has the hockey stick that's 13 years out, says they're going to make it, because uh, it's a quarter-by-quarter quarter society, right? And I'm sure that's a you know, pretty well-known fact, but uh, it just that dynamic has changed dramatically within, within most firms. Now, is that in play within my organization? Pretty much, right? Probably in most organizations today, is you know, we, you know, we want to see that quick win. You know, where are those quick wins? So maybe it's the maybe we're going back to Edisonian type mentality and going, how fast can we learn? How fast can we fail and get on with something that is a Fleetwood Mac, a Fleetwood Mac rumors? Now, one of the things that has come up already this afternoon is this notion of of touching things, feeling them you know, taking them apart, putting them back together, and Edison was a tinkerer. This was a big part of how he learned. So we, we don't have lots of opportunities for kids to do this, even at the grade school and middle school level, which is where they do decide, do I like math, do I like science, and we see, you know, girls and boys at various ages branching off into other areas of interest. It's crucial that we have some kind of impetus at the grade school and middle school level for science engagement, but not in the sense of equations, not in the sense of learning facts. Edison wasn't learning facts. He was just playing around. So project work, teachers that can offer after school activity, anything like that, but especially classroom learning along the lines of what the Discovery Channel is espousing. Um, they have an upcoming curiosity series and many other programs that help open up young minds. This is the future. We're all naturally good designers. We're all naturally good creative thinkers. I do think the education system that's focused on getting the right answer, and we all know that we only learn something when you get the wrong answer, but we're all entirely focused on the wrong thing. And while it's, ex it, it's important for learning and education to be exciting, it's also important that we think about the systems that, in which education exists and how we measure success and um, think, you know, really changing some of that as well. Edison, at the same time on that train, was also had a chemistry set. He'd gone and collected all the things he needed for a chemistry set. He was teaching himself chemistry. He wasn't worried about getting the right answer. That's exactly the point. 
Um, we are too, I think, devoted to this notion that there, there's a set of knowledge that we need to impart to people that they then need to, you know, pare it back on a test. But in fact, real learning is about uh, trying, failing, learning from that failing, and then figuring out the solutions on your own. You may need help doing that, but a lot of, a lot of that and a lot of what made Edison successful was learning how to learn and learning from failure. And I think that's the thing we don't teach enough of uh, in the current system. It's really interesting what you say, because of course now we are all, or many of us are buying iPads, and the big triumph of an iPad is you can reach into the screen and move objects around and move pages around with a whisk of the finger. But I mean, isn't that what we do anyway with physical objects? And so, you know, you think about uh, the, the days gone by when you did get a Gilbert um, chemistry set or an erector set or, you know, all of these kind of packaged environments where you could actually mess around and try things out with minimal risk to having things blow up or, you know, set the house on fire there was or whatever. Fire on the train, I should, I should. That's there was a, that, that's, for, that's for the next panel, but, um, you know, the question today is what are, what are the tools, what are the media, what are the uh, experiences that uh, young people get to have in their native environments and, you know, aside from uh, digital entertainment, you know. We've put together a, a multi-million dollar initiative, and on Science Channel, there's a kid's block for middle schoolers, and we take all the tricks from YouTube, all the tricks from gaming, to try and get kids excited about science, math, engineering, technology. It's not just about taking tests, and I think that's an area we've got to do a better job. So are you optimistic we're going to be able to get to a better place with regard to, you know, how our young are embracing STEM? I think as a nation, we've got to hit that tipping point. And it's got to be from the business sector, from the private sector, all of us. It's all of our responsibilities to lead that charge and to make science and math as sexy as entertainment that's out there. And it's to all of us, um, you know, if you've got scientists, get them to be that great communicator, get them to be the heroes, get them to show how fun innovation can be. How do we get that to be the new role models? Well, we could go on, uh, it seems. Uh, quite a bit. This has been a really uh, rich conversation, I think, and I, I want uh, to invite you all to join me in thanking this terrific panel for this uh, session. Thank you.